circles, walk around in 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 circles, walk I'm not recommending them yeah. because you are kind of more likely to die or just have this utterly humiliated, mediocre existence. And I got to say, like, all the stuff that I needed to do drugs for then, and I remember telling somebody, like, oh, you know, I only need drugs to uh, have sex uh, and make music. And a tiny voice in my head was like, those are the best things. Hmm. Like, those are the best things in the world. Something is weird. Yeah. Yeah, and now it's all, like, actually, in fact, better than uh, the drug days, which I'm astounded to tell you. Uh, I, you know, I was enmeshed in the really abusive marriage that was soul coughing. And I think, like, if I had gotten out of that, I would have found another abusive marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm just, like, I come from a messed up house, a messed up family, and, like, if you're that guy and you're an addict... You're just going to find those relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the idea of soul coughing, a band that many people still love as an abusive relationship, uh, th this, will this be a revelation to real so soul coughing fans? Has this been sort of out there? Ones that have followed my solo career have noted my extreme distaste <laughs> to which I respond to like soul coughing requests. So they have an inkling, but I really think... Um, I, yeah, I'm getting a lot of uh, tweets of shock and amazement mm -hmm. that, uh, that this was how it went down. You know? All right, so y you started as y you were a doorman at the Knitting Factory. Correct. Uh, this would have been, I guess, when the Knitting 91, Factory was 92, on yeah, Leonard Houston Street. Street. Houston Street. Oh, wait, the yeah, first one. Way back okay. and way back. Um, it then moved to Leonard Street. Now it's out in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know... Uh, uh, important club on the alternative music scene. Indeed. You're working the door, that's your entry. You meet these other musicians, you're writing songs, but you're also a good deal younger than the rest Ten of the guys. 10 years younger than the rest of those guys. Which when you're 22, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and initially they were just like, whatever, this guy's the doorman, and just sort of showed up. I don't even know why they showed up for those gigs. They certainly did not seem to care at the time. <laughs> uh, and then suddenly, like record companies showed up, and, uh, you know, I wanted to be, I was very sort of generous. I wanted everybody to, like, have a stake in it. But basically, everybody wanted an equal stake with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, said some stuff that I find pretty abusive to get me in a place where I was... Uh, you know, where I was like beat up enough to be like, oh, you're right. I don't. I'm not really very meaningful in this band. It's all about you guys. And yeah, it was just. Uh, it was super messed up. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, you, you say these days that maybe there's a handful of, of songs from the old band that you still like. There's like I like uh, Idiot King's uh, song called Three Hundred Dollars. I like soundtrack to Mary. I like, but most of it. Uh, it's just really like just a whole, you know, big fat cup of hot disappointment for me mm -hmm. because it really, um, you know, it was this kind of cute, weird cult band that like we had the muscle to take on the Beastie Boys. We, we really had it. And, you know, it seemed like my bandmates were so spiteful towards this kid that was so much younger than them that they disliked so much that they just uh, they sunk their own boat. It was really crazy. I mean, the band basically broke up because uh, a manager called who just thought we were insane and didn't want to work with us anymore. And I was like a deep, you know, horrible, junky, gray character. And, uh, and you write that you didn't know he was calling you exactly. to basically fire you. So basically I was like, I hate this band. I don't want to be in this band. And he was like, okay, well, you should break it up. <laughs> like now's the time to break he, it up. He, he, and he got out of being able to tell like the man at death's door that he was getting fired. Right. But yeah, that was what uh that was the godsend. Who, yeah, I had a friend that kept showing up. Uh I dated and, her in uh the early nineties and she'd been clean for a bunch of years. She was like a teenage dope fiend in the legendary days of the Lower East Side, and she was uh um, she she liked me because I wasn't drinking liquor, as I said. But then we were at a party, and she tasted coke in my mouth when she kissed me. And she's like, yeah, this isn't going to work. Right. So she dumped me. But she never cut you off. For years, she would show up, and she'd be like, hey, what's going on? 
and she would always have something amazing happening. Like she was, she uh, like, oh, I really got into reading uh, mystery books. So I wrote all these writers, and I'm friends with all these great mystery writers, and I'm writing about horseback riding and or racing, and uh, I'm learning the piano. And I was so resentful because I just felt she had no right to be having fun mm. because she wasn't on drugs. Whereas I was on drugs. You were the rock and, star. I was a rock star, and I was basically in a holiday and getting high by myself. Yeah. My dream had turned into like the king of all lousy jobs. Mm-hmm. And you know, at some point I was just like, fine, I'll get high when I wake up in the morning because somebody will just push me out on stage and that's it. But I mean, early on, like I, I, I just remember, you know, every band from New York that got a record deal had to like sneakily put out a seven inch with some indie label or else they felt like, you know, they were, you know, gonna be decried as right. sellouts. But I was like, Dude, come on now. <laughs> uh, Jaime from Tribeca writes, $300 is one of my favorite soul coughing songs. I wonder why it's one of his. Wh- what do you as a songwriter hear in that old song? I tell you what, what happened, uh, which was a rare occurrence, is uh, I wrote the song to a loop, to like a, something I did on a sampler, just like a really basic kind of jungle drum and bass beat, you know, like, and, um, and I got into the studio and our drummer would do this very weird thing where he wouldn't want to play a beat. He would find a beat like not original not original enough. And so you'd ask him to play something and he'd be like, yeah, I just played it. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't it. That was, no, it's the same beat. It's the same beat. Like really like psychotic time. And when I taught him this song uh, and he was playing weirdly, I, I think I visibly crumpled. Like, it just couldn't handle it. And so I guess I guilt-tripped in, him into playing the beat that I wanted. Mm. So it actually one of those few songs that actually turned out to be what I wanted it to be. The band The Long Winters, you quote from their song, New Girl, yeah. at, the top of the, at the top of the story, twice you burned your life's work, once to start a new life, and once just to start a fire. That's right. What is this book? Is this you starting a fire? Yeah, this is the second time. Yep. I really like. I, I wanted that uh, quote. I was like, I was like, why do I want that clo- quote? I don't do it twice. And then I realized that this this book is me starting a fire. You know, you already saved your life by getting clean. And yeah. Being... Exactly. Yep. So, this is Mike Doty starting a brush fire in the music world with his memoir called The Book of Drugs. The uh, book is out now, along with this uh, this two CD live album, The Question Jar Show, which is both music and banter with the audience, and which is banter. a lot of fun. Mike, great fun to have you with us oh, on yeah, Soundcheck absolutely. today. Thanks, Thanks so much.